what I often recommend is as you're going through and you notice as you're reading the little things that you might want to counsel on at some point, just take a note of that and, and save it for that two minute point after which, you know, you, you can't really advance the case anymore, but you can still place the final orders. Uh, and that would be a, a great opportunity to, to kind of make sure you clean all of that up. But just as long as you have a running list, you'll be able to remember everything. Um, and so we'll, we'll run through it one more time. We'll do another uh, sample case with you all. And um, and kind of let you see the EMR itself. Of course, it's hard to make it fully interactive over this webinar format, but you can see the interface and how you how you kind of go about navigating it. And um, and so we'll we'll dive into the second case here. Um, and so we have a, a patient in the emergency department. He's a, a 65 year old man, and he's been having sharp chest pain and respiratory distress. He's in acute distress, moaning and holding his hands over the right side of his chest. And so immediately your, your, your gear should start turning about, you know, differential diagnoses for chest pain and respiratory distress. And, you know, this is, it, keep it pretty broad right now. You don't really have too much information to help you narrow down to maybe one specific thing. But of course, as you go, the goal is to get there. Uh, um, and so what we'll do is we'll, we'll switch to the next screen that shows um, some of his vitals. So you can see that he is afebrile, but he is tachycardic, he is tachypnic, and he is hypotensive. Uh, his um, vitals are only otherwise notable for uh, an elevated BMI, but, but otherwise pretty unremarkable. Um, and so I, I think we can take a second here. If anyone wants to throw out any diagnoses that they're thinking about or, or things that they're concerned about here right up off the bat. And, and remember with these questions, um, the, the diagnosis is often, you know, I don't mean to say it like it's always readily apparent. You, you'll have questions that are a little bit of a diagnostic mystery and you have to kind of figure it out from the orders that you place and the workup that you do. But oftentimes they, they drive it home pretty well. Great. I love, you guys are so on it. So we have a lot of, a lot of people thinking about uh, great things for, for respiratory distress and chest pain. We have PE, we have uh, a, um, aortic dissection, we have uh, acute coronary syndrome, um, pneumothorax, Perfect. All right. So we're going to get a little bit more of the history here. Um, and so the uh, patient is an accountant. He um, was brought in after he developed excruciating sharp pain in the right side of his chest and that respiratory distress that we, we discussed. It's eight out of 10. It increases with respiration. So that's, that's a term that we would term pleuritic chest pain, uh, chest pain that gets worse with the deep breath. Um, unable to answer questions. Never had this before, but he's had emphysema and asthma for years. He's been getting oxygen during transport. Okay. All right. So, uh, you know, as we go, if you guys have any thoughts or ways you want to refine your differential diagnosis for what might be going on, um, feel free to chime in. Um, and so uh, I'm going to actually go back real quick and ask you guys, what, what components of the physical exam do you want to order before I give you those data points? Great, yeah, perfect. Chest, pulmonary, lung, heart, exactly. So remember the big four, you know, you're always gonna wanna do um, a cardiovascular exam. Um, you're always going to wanna do, uh, you're always gonna have, wanna have a, a general idea of the general appearance of the patient. You're always gonna wanna do a lung exam, um, an abdominal exam. Like these are pretty bread and butter routine kind of things that, that you're always gonna do. A, generally a head and neck exam is always warranted. In other scenarios where it might be less helpful or, or maybe hold you back a little bit in terms of time, they're probably not gonna penalize you in terms of points or some of the other components of the exam. But you know, you can, if you're ever unsure and you think there might be helpful data points, it's, it's better to be broad than to, to miss something, both because they want you to do a thorough physical exam. And number two, because it may help you figure out what the diagnosis is if you're not sure. And so I'm going to, there's a lot of um, text here, and it can be hard to navigate this, especially when you're under the pressure of the timing on the exam. Um, and, and just to state, when, whenever you're confronted with this kind of thing, I think it's best just to take a deep breath, kind of get your bearings a little bit. I, I am of the tendency, if I see all of this, I'm going to try to blast through it. And I often find that that holds me back more than anything, because the time I'm spending rapidly trying to incorporate all this information into my brain is not working and it's not, you know, it's, it's time ends up being time wasted instead of time saved. Um, so he is, is overweight, as we already know from his um, vitals. He's moaning and holding hands over the right side of his chest. Okay, so that all kind of fits with the, the history that we received so far. He's pale and cool. And, and that's, that's important, you know, you might think that that might just be like, oh, okay, that's kind of a curiosity, but but your, your skin temperature can often be a marker of end organ perfusion. 
Um, and if your skin is becoming cold, if, if the patient is becoming cold, you start to worry about, you know, they're not perfusing and they're going into shock. And we already know that his blood pressure is 90 over 60. So that's, that's not good. That's a little concerning in this case. Um, there are some uh, components. Uh, so in the head and neck exam, there's some um, pertinent positives and component pertinent positives. So I'll just read those out for the sake of time that he has slight tracheal deviation to the left. His jugular venous distension. Uh, he has hyper, so in the chest exam, he has hyper resonance to percussion on the right. He has no breast sounds on the, presumably on the right then, um, but he has breast sounds present on the left. And then uh, we already know that he has the jugular venous distension from before. And looking through the rest of it, there's not a whole lot that stands out to me other than he's still unable to answer questions due to respiratory distress. So, so what do you guys think? Is there a diagnosis that's standing out to you? Anything from the data that we now have to help you refine your differential diagnosis even further? I think some people were chiming in before with what they thought. Yeah, perfect. Great, I love it, you guys are so on it. So this is a pneumothorax. And, and when you see that kind of shock-like picture, especially think about a tension pneumothorax, which is what everyone, that is a phenomenal job guys, a tension pneumothorax. And so when you see that jugular venous distension, when you see that hypotension, when you see the cool extremities, it's, it's pretty concerning in this case. Um, and, so, uh, and so we'll keep plugging along. Um, this is kind of the order panel that, that I, would, I would dive into up front. Uh, he's already got oxygen and, and oftentimes this will uh, already be pre-populated because they already started. As mentioned, as Callie mentioned before, you know, oftentimes, you know, in, in real life, you don't necessarily need that order placing a peripheral IV or all of these um, kind of uh, more specific kind of things because it's already kind of been done in real time. Um, but but on this exam, you, you kind of do. Uh, in this case, we have, um, uh, in this case, we have to put all of that kind of thing. And so the oxygen is already here. And this is one case where they, they're actually already giving that to us. But some other things that I also think about, so he's having chest pain. And so you want to, you want to still keep a broad differential diagnosis, as, as Callie mentioned before. You want to make sure that you're considering, you're not anchoring just on pneumothorax and, and forgetting about other important diagnoses. So getting an EKG as listed down here, um, a troponin, um, you know, there might be the, the JVD might be related to some heart failure. So maybe getting a BNP. Your routine labs are almost always going to be correct to obtain. So at least a CMP, you know, get your LFTs and your basic metabolic panel and a CBC so that you kind of know what's going on in their blood. And, you know, when I was going through this, I felt pretty confident in the diagnosis of uh, attention pneumothorax. And so I don't know if you guys remember the adage. I felt like it was drilled into my brain when I was on surgery as a, as a medical student, but I mean, do a, a, a needle thoracostomy in the second intercostal space in the midclavicular line. And, and does anyone know why we do that or what you would expect afterwards? Um, I'll give you guys a, a second to chime in. I'm also going to be consulting people that are going to be better at this kind of thing and managing this kind of thing than I am. So, you know, this is a, a pulmonary problem. It's a, a, a thoracic problem. So I want thoracic surgery here. Um, pulmonary medicine to figure out why they're having this pneumothorax. You know, he has, um, he has emphysema and he has asthma, which are risk factors for developing one. Um, great. So, so some thoughts uh, chiming in in the chat. So really the, the, the needle thoracostomy is just to offload that pressure. Remember that attention pneumothorax is like a one-way valve. So you're filling up that pleural space with tons and tons and tons of air that every time you breathe in pushes more into the pleural space, but then you can't get it back out. And so this kind of gives an offshoot for all of that air to get out of the pleural space and to help relieve that pressure. And then um, it buys you time for the definitive treatment, which is going to ultimately be this tube thoracostomy or, or a chest tube. Um, and so, um, so to move on from this, um, it, it, at the end, so we, we kind of executed really the entire plan at this point. Uh, we have by ordering that by ordering the needle thoracostomy. I think I, they'll give you a little blurb in the in the subsequent screens that there's a whoosh of air that comes out, which is exactly what we're looking for. Um, and then after you place the chest tube, you want to make sure you get a chest X-ray to make sure it's positioned correctly, and that closes out the case. Um, and so this is a, an example. You know, we, um, we a question that I often get with students is. What, what does it mean that the case ended? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? And generally, it, it means that you've seen this through to completion. So your treatment, your, your plan for the patient is, is done. You've kind of done everything that you need to do and, um, and, and it's finished. 
And you may not, it doesn't necessarily mean that you got every single possible point that you could have. It, 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 I don't, I don't I, it might be a little bit of bad news to say that it doesn't mean that everything was done perfectly, but it does mean that you you treated the patient and you took care of them. And um, and so it shouldn't be something that causes any consternation. And if anything, you should you should feel good that you you got to the end. Um, the converse where the case is still going and the patient is still uncomfortable or in pain, or you're still not sure what they have, obviously that would be less ideal than, than having it end. Um, again, just to reemphasize, don't forget that counseling at the end. So, uh, you know, the patient was a smoker, then make sure you're taking note of that and then counseling on smoking at the end. And then they do ask you for what you think the diagnosis is. And so you can punch into a text box, the, the diagnosis that you think the patient ultimately had, um, and so just to highlight a couple more key points from this case, read the history and physical exam carefully. This patient, you know, you might think about getting a chest x-ray up front, or you might think about getting a CT scan, or, you know, are there other things that you want to, <clears throat> are you still thinking about a PE, are you still thinking about, and, uh, and the, the point is this patient is unstable, you know, they're, they're hypotensive, they're going into shock, they need treatment now, and they need treatment quickly. And because of that, you know, if you delay that treatment, Number one, the, the interface is going to start putting pressure on you, like the patient is still obtunded, you know, the, the patient is still uncomfortable or in pain. And, uh, and number two, it's going, to, it's going to adversely affect your score. You know, you, you have to be able to, um, a, a part of the scoring is making sure that you're doing things in a timely manner. And if you're not doing that, if you're not, you know, it, it, moving forward placement of a chest tube on the right time scale, that'll also come, come through and how, uh, how it's evaluated. Um, so, so all of that's to say, uh, just keep an idea back to the point about sick or not sick. And of course, this is a perfect example of a patient who's pretty sick. Um, all right. So Kelly, anything else you would add or any other um, tips or tricks you'd use for a case like this or, or any other cases? No, I think that, um, yeah, you covered that really well. The only other thing that I'll um, add here, just because I thought um, the, the orders um, was a great example of this. I've had numerous people ask me, um, you know, like in a moment of panic, right? Like you might forget the name of like a procedure or a, um, you know, like, test you need to order or something like that. Um, so just for like reference, when you type in, like, for, for example, like say you like didn't know that it was called like, you know, like a, some people would say like needle decompression, right? If you type in needle, like on um, the interface, it'll give you like all of the orders that contain the word needle. Um, and same thing with like, if you put in like thoracotomy, it would like, you know, like it would give you everything. So um, if you like are in a moment of panic and can't remember the name of, I don't know, like, like cholecystectomy, I know that's an easy one, but like, if you're like, oh, the patient has cholecystitis, what's the name of the surgery? You could start typing cholecystitis um, and it'll come up. So I think that's helpful because a lot of people just like in under pressure, you like forget the names of things. That is so true. Yeah, definitely leverage that search engine to your advantage. Yes, I remember like typing in random things and like hoping to find what I wanted, so.